Okay, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today on Child Obesity, the Parents Toolkit. Um, maybe you're here because you're concerned about your child's weight, or perhaps you wanna learn how you can better improve your child's health overall. Or maybe you're here because you wanna be a good auntie, uncle, or godparent, regardless. In today's session, we'll go through several tools that you can use to ensure uh, the children in your life have good nutrition for optimal health. Okay, a little bit about me. Um, I just wanna state as a disclaimer, I am not a doctor and will not be providing medical advice. Instead, I'll offer general tips. So please consult your primary care doctor or pediatrician for recommendations specific to you and your family. Also keep in mind that not all strategies work for all bodies. We're individuals with unique genes, medical history, environmental exposures, and current conditions. Uh, so keep an open mind, try new things, and see what works for you and your family. According to the World Health Organization, 39 million children under five were overweight or obese in 2020. Over 340 million children in adolescents aged five to 11 were overweight or obese in 2016. So these statistics are hard to believe. <laughs> There's just um, not just one thing that we can point our finger to as a solution. Many things confound childhood obesity. Food marketing saturates children with unhealthy food advertisements, high fat, high sugar foods and artificial sweeteners to desensitize their reward systems and predispose them to food addic addiction. Um, metabolic changes ensure a lifelong battle with obesity and body image and self-perception that can lead to depression and disordered eating. So parents and caregivers play an integral role. In our session today, we'll explore what we can do to help our children. So what is your role? It's modeling healthy eating, minimizing the marketing exposure, providing good food options, and promoting exercise. Then we'll discuss success factors. So that covers parenting style, family involvement, basic nutrition, nutrition education, and healthy habits. We'll also look at some challenges parents face and how to solve them, such as picky eaters, um, grocery shopping, and issues when eating out with children. In our final section, I'll tease you with the list of fun and nutrition uh, activities that you can do with your family that we'll cover in our next session together. The focus is on health, not weight. All right, let's jump right in to the parent's role. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics published guidelines in 2016 that include four evidence-based strategies that pediatricians and parents can use to help all children avoid both obesity and eating disorders. So that's modeling the healthy healthy behavior, um, it's minimizing the fast food and marketing, it's providing good food options and promoting exercise and an active lifestyle. So how can you model healthy eating behavior? Do not, dis do not encourage dieting. So don't tell your child that they must go on a diet or should be better at watching what they eat. Research shows that dieting is a risk factor for eating disorders and obesity. So for example, teens who died in ninth grade are three times more likely than their peers to be overweight in 12th grade. And moreover, calorie counting diets can deprive growing teenagers of the energy and nutrients they need. So instead, you wanna encourage healthier, mindful eating. Eat regular meals together. So eating together allows time for your children to see what healthy choices you are making. It provides structure for their day and a time to communicate. Studies show that family meals result an additional serving of vegetables or fruit per person per day compared to families that did not eat together. Um, this is a dietary impact that lasts for years. And parents can both model healthy eating behavior at family meals and just as important, they're monitoring their, healthy, uh, their child's eating habits and behaviors. You wanna avoid weight talk. So avoid commenting on your weight or your child's weight. Instead, conversations should be about healthy eating habits. Um, when talk centers on healthy eating, adolescents are less likely to engage in unhealthy or maladaptive eating behavior. Never tease teens about their weight. 40% of teen girls are teased about their weight in early adolescence and girls teased are twice as likely to be overweight in five years. So they are also more likely to engage in unhealthy weight control behaviors. Boys were also prone to overweight and unhealthy behaviors as young adults if they were teased as teenagers. 
You want to help children develop a healthy body image. Half of the adolescent girls and 25% of adolescent boys do not like their body weight or shape. And parents should encourage adolescents to eat a balanced diet and exercise for fitness, not for weight loss. Okay, pop quiz. True or false? Exposing children to healthy food choices and viewing food as a source of joy and nourishment rather than an enemy can improve their body image and relationship with food. This is true. If they see you are trying all the latest fad diets, demonizing certain foods, and constantly commenting on how you have failed your diet, this is not the type of behavior you want them to copy. So be sure to promote healthy food choices and conversations. All right, now let's talk about some of the outside influences on your children and what you should do. Um, the World Health Organization states that there is unequivocal evidence that childhood obesity is influenced by marketing of foods and non-alcoholic beverages, high in saturated fat, sugar, uh, salt, and a core recommendation is to reduce children's exposure to all such marketing. So what can you do? Limit online viewing hours to no more than one hour per day. This might be very hard to do. Um, you also want to make sure that you're monitoring your child's viewing behavior through ad blockers, apps without advertisements, and online protection services to minimize their exposure to advertisements. So be sure to actually go check these out and see how you can minimize their exposure. It may be well worth paying for the streaming services and the apps to eliminate the app, the ads. Know the websites, the games, and social media sites that your child visits, and replace time that would be spent on online um, activities with sports, games, hobbies, other activity family outings. You want to be aware of messaging and marketing on food products. So, for example, this Yo Baby yogurt, it's organic yogurt for babies, six months to two years, and has nine grams of sugar in each serving. That's over two teaspoons, six grams of added sugar. What's shocking is that it's also the number one pediatrician recommended brand. A better option is this Too Good with two grams of sugar. And here you can see the recommended amounts from the American Heart Association. Children zero to two years should have zero sugar. Two years and older, three to six teaspoons of added sugar. And the WHO recommends less than 5% of calories should be coming from sugar. You want to watch out for the tricky language. So sugar-free is less than 0.5 grams of sugar per serving, so it is not actually sugar-free. Um, reduced sugar or less sugar, that means at least 25% fewer sugars per serving compared to a standard serving size of the traditional variety. So that's popular with fruit snacks and drinks. No added sugars or without added sugars means no sugars or sugar-containing ingredients like juice or dried fruit are added during processing. And low sugar, there's no defined standard or definition, so be sure to check out the nutrition label. It's not just sweet things, savory items have sugar too. A Domino's hand-tossed pizza has about nine grams of sugar per serving. Uh, a while back there was a headline from the um, about Subway's bread, Ireland's Supreme Court ruled that Subway bread has too much sugar to be called bread and thus should be taxed as a confectionery or candy. Um, just for reference, there's about five grams of sugar in the Italian white bread and a McDonald's Big Mac bun has 5.8 grams of sugar. Be careful of beverages. One serving of organic coconut water has 20 grams of sugar. An eight ounce glass of orange juice contains 26 grams of sugar and a 20 ounce bottle of cherry Dr. Pepper has a whopping 69 grams of sugar. That's over 17 teaspoons of sugar. So avoid drinking your calories, stick to water. Okay, pop quiz. True or false? The overwhelming majority of foods marketed to children are of poor nutritional quality. So do you think this statistic is accurate? Three quarters, around 73%, of the foods advertised on television shows intended for children are convenience, fast foods, and sweets. What do you think? Well, it is true. Messages online, in school, on billboards, on television, and on product labels, these all influence our children. So you need to be vigilant in monitoring these various channels and the extent of exposure. Okay. Let's focus on providing the right food. There are three simple, not necessarily easy, but decisive steps that par parents can take to prevent childhood obesity. 
One is to offer whole, as close to nature foods, so I eat minimally processed items that don't come in a bag, a box, or from a factory. Second, provide a variety of nutrient-dense options, including protein, healthy fats, vegetables, and low-sugar fruits. And we'll talk more about these first two throughout uh, the presentation. But for now, let's focus on this third step, which is to reduce the amount of sugar in their diet. Sugar harms children and adults alike. A study showed that health markers improved drastically after just nine days of limiting the sugar. So these were participants who, um, that were children between the ages of nine and 18 who were obese and had at least one other chronic mel metabolic disorder like high blood pressure, high triglyceride levels, or fatty liver markers. Um, researchers kept the calorie consumption at the same level, but replaced participants' diet with lower sugar, complex carbohydrate options. So all high sugar cereals, pastries, sweetened yogurts were removed. And overall, the dietary sugar was reduced from 28 to 10%, which is still well above the 5% um, percent recommended by the World Health Organization. Okay, so just after nine days on the sugar-restricted diet, every aspect of the participants' metabolic health improved. Even though calories were maintained and even increased when participants started to lose weight, participants did lose weight. Additionally, blood pressure decreased by five millimeters of mercury, uh, triglycerides by 33 points, LDL, LDL cholesterol by 10 points, and liver function tests improved. Fasting blood glucose went down by five points and insulin levels were cut by one third. That's amazing. An additional benefit of reducing sugar is that the children started responding to internal satiety cues and the feeling of fullness after having eaten enough. The children reported that it felt as if they had ate more food, even though they consumed the same number of calories as before. The difference was that they were eating significantly less sugar. So this study shows that measures of metabolic health improve just by swapping out the simple sugars without changing calories or weight or exercise. Uh, all calories are not equal. Where they come from does matter. In another recent large cohort study, they found that a child with obesity has a fourfold greater risk of being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes by age 25 than a child of normal weight. So as you can see by these studies, excess sugar, it turns into fat, it triggers insulin resistance, and can result in diabetes, heart issues, or liver disease down the road. It is not suitable for your kids, and it isn't good for you either. So if you need to be reminded, as a good role model for your kids, eating sugar yourself does not do your body any favors. It's a vicious cycle of spiking your blood glucose levels, plummeting, causing cravings, and then can contribute to all sorts of issues for your body. Inflammation, brain health, immune system strength, body aches, dental health, heart health, et cetera. Okay, so we're all on the same page that you will improve your children's overall health if you reduce sugar in your household. Let's talk about how you can do this, right? Well, you can start by cutting back on the processed streets, treats, the cakes, the cookies, the donuts, the pies, the breads, um, and sweetened beverages. Uh, here are some strategies that you can try. And you don't necessarily have to go cold turkey. Your kids, I know, they might revolt. So here are some ways to try. Um, you can reduce treats to every other day or once a week. Don't replace the sweets as you eat them. So this is a slow process of getting rid of it. You can reduce the size of the desserts and don't offer second helpings out of the house or out of sight. So get rid of the cookie jar, the candy drawer, the secret stash. Cook and serve more vegetable options at meals, crowding out the bad with the good. Wean your children off of sweetened beverages by using water. Have cut up vegetables on hand, pre-portioned nuts and seeds, and then wrap sandwiches with lettuce. Don't let them fill up on the bread. Also check the ingredient list on the food label to see if there is sugar. Here's some common names, cane sugar, evaporated cane sugar, honey, corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup. Look for ingredients such as crystal solids, maple syrup, and brown rice syrup. Sugar can also be hiding in products that you might not expect like whole grain cereals and granola, frozen foods with sauces, pasta sauce, chocolate milk, canned baked beans, canned soup, uh, low fat products such as yogurt or coffee drinks often add sugar to compensate for the low fat. And of course, condiments typically have some sugar in them. So um, I have a whole program on quitting sugar and reducing sugar. So please check into that if you're interested. All right, 
while removing sugar, it's a good idea to make swaps. Now, swapping aims to help you and your family eat healthier, right? Getting more vitamins, minerals, fiber, and nutrients without feeling deprived. So instead of the muffins, pancakes, uh, you want to have something with protein, right? The poached eggs on top of steamed vegetables like asparagus or peas. Instead of the low-fat yogurt with sugar-laden granola, choose instead full-fat Greek yogurt and make your own granola by roasting unsweetened coconut nuts and seeds. Instead of refined pasta and rice, you want to swap for a number of different vegetables, spiralized zucchini, spaghetti squash, rice cauliflower, seaweed pasta, lots of different options. And instead of dessert, you can stop by start by so, uh, swapping it for a fresh bowl of fruit salad. And then when you're completely off of sugar, you can instead have a, a cheese tray. Uh, here's a list of fruits and their sugar contents. Obviously, the berries, avocado, melons, et cetera, are good choices. Nut butters are also a satisfying treat. Just be sure that you have um, one tablespoon, which is one serving. When shop, swapping out sugar, think of healthy fats that you can substitute, which will provide the satiety for your child. Uh, more on healthy fats in a bit. Pop quiz, true or false? All kids and teens need to have snacks every day. What do you think, true or false? That is false. As soon as you say all kids and every day, it isn't going to be true. Kids need to have small snacks tend to have small stomachs, so they may need to eat more often than adults. And it's also true that providing healthy snacks, think protein, healthy fats, nuts, seeds, vegetables, hummus, can be a crucial way to ensure children are getting the nutrients they need. Just be sure to provide balanced meals at regular meal times with healthy snacks as needed, but do not allow the child to graze all day. Okay, let's talk about promoting exercise for your child. There are many benefits to exercise. According to the World Health Organization, exercise is one of the most potent ways to prevent childhood or lifelong obesity. Physical activity can reduce the risk of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. It improves your children's ability to learn, improves mental health, well-being, and body image, and of course, increases social and scholastic competence. So what can parents do? Well, first of all, you want to model an active lifestyle. So what physical activities do you do to keep in shape? How do your kids see your commitment to your health? You want to encourage short bouts of intensive exercise interspersed throughout the day. So a study showed that exercising in 10-minute spurts throughout the day, like playing tag, shooting hoops, running around a playground, cleared glucose from the blood quicker and increased fat burning. You want to incorporate walking after meals as a family routine. And then look for ways to make exercise a part of everyday life. So using school-based activities, community activities, and family outings. So tell me in the chat, what do you do to promote exercise for your family? Um, we chose our neighborhood specifically for its walkability, and we try to to limit the amount of time in our car. So this is how my daughter grew up. She knows nothing different and is used to walking everywhere. Okay, factors for success. In the 1980s, researchers McCovey and Martin identified four types of parenting which were based on the degree of warmth or responsiveness and control or demandingness shown by the parents. So the top right, you have authoritative, high responsiveness and warmth with high demandingness and control. So you solve problems together with a child, set clear rules and expectations and open communication with natural consequences. And you can see the remaining three and we're gonna focus on authoritative. The results of one study showed that authoritarian, the green box and neglectful parenting, the yellowish box, we're associated with 44% and 26% increased likelihood of obesity. Uh, the results of parenting style are long lasting. So let's talk about the, the authoritative parenting style, which has many benefits. And they are, it gives children emotional security. It provides children with a base of self-worth. It helps children learn self-regulation. It facilitates social integration. It models healthy practices, and it sets reasonable expectations for children's behavior. The authors noted that parental influence may wane 
in adolescents when peers influence their children's behavior. Um, and this, of course, might affect food choices, smoking activity levels, and other healthy lifestyle factors. Okay. So tell me, what barriers prevent you from putting healthier behaviors into practice? Tell me in the chat. Um, this is one of the questions in a real online survey of 461 parents, which showed that most parents know what behaviors are elements of a healthier lifestyle, yet many cannot put that knowledge into practice. So, for example, 91% of parents know their family should eat a balanced diet, yet only 56% say their household does. And 93% show that their family should exercise regularly, yet only 45% say their home does. While 59% of parents say that everyone in the family knows what they should be doing to lead a healthy lifestyle, only 23% say everyone in the family practices good, healthy habits. Okay, so the actual survey results showed these were the top five reasons given, with the number one being the lack of time at 48% then lack of motivation at 46%, lack of willpower was 45%, lack of money was 36%, and lack of participation from some members of the family at 29%. Okay, so I've given you a lot of information, but hopefully <laughs> strategies that you can actually implement and put into practice. Let's talk about some family involvement. They, families can affect healthy weight by being there, sharing meals, and modeling healthy eating. In a study of 200 families, researchers found that when family meals lasted longer than 20 minutes and occurred a minimum of four times a week, the children weighed significantly less than peers whose family dinners were shorter than this. So researchers, researchers state that it's during this time that families engage in positive forms of direct communication and show genuine concern about each other's act activities. Um, the family models healthy eating habits, affirms physical activities like, hey, we're gonna go on a hike this weekend. Um, the extra time also allows children to pay attention to internal cues of fullness that signal them to stop eating. Regular meal times help children recognize early hunger cues and prevent uh, grazing and snacking throughout the day. Families that did not have family meal times, those children ate fewer fruits and vegetables and more foods with high sugar and fat levels. Further, when families allow electronic media while eating, children's risks for obesity increase because it impedes the positive communication and social interaction. It increases exposure to food marketing and leads to eating mindlessly, um, consuming greater amounts of unhealthy foods and ignoring feelings of fullness. Other factors to be taken in consideration are culture and ethnicity, ethnicity, ethnicity sorry. Um, Culture is a lifestyle, food habits, customs, social behaviors, traditions, values, art, music, beliefs, knowledge. Ethnicity is people with common similarities such as nationality, origin, and religion. So how does your culture perceive what is healthy and influence what and how much you eat? So some cultures such as traditional Latin American and African see larger women as healthier and more attractive. In the West, thinness is valued. Culture affects mothers' perception of themselves and their children regarding ideal body weight. It influences the mother's cooking and feeding habits, which children use as a model for normal eating. If the food presenting on the dinner table is primarily high in calories and given in large portions, the child may see this as normal. So maintaining a healthy weight may be difficult in childhood and later in life. So look at your typical dishes and portions to see how you can make them healthier. Let's take another poll here. How might you healthify a dish? Can you use a little less sugar or substitute seed oils with something else or reduce the amount? Can you only cook enough for one serving per person and supplement with more steamed or raw vegetable options? Um, for example, my mom made a lot of casseroles that used canned soups, high in sodium, preservatives, and chemicals. And my sister loves casseroles and enjoys making these foods for her family but she now makes them from scratch. So she controls the quality of ingredients going into those dishes. So I see this as a way of healthifying the recipe and doing better without giving up the dishes that my sister enjoyed as a child. So maybe you have some dishes that you could healthify a bit.
Okay, eating healthy is a journey shaped by many factors, including the child's stage of life, situations, preferences, access to food, culture, traditions, and the personal decisions made over time. Children need to learn that all their food and beverage choices count. So first, let's ensure you have some nutrition basics that you can then educate your children. First, what is a calorie? So a calorie is a unit used to measure the energy content of foods and beverages. Our bodies need the energy to function, grow, and thrive. Second, second, what is a nutrient? So a nutrient is a substance in food that our body uses to function and grow. We get nutrients from what we eat and drink. Fats, carbohydrates, and proteins are macronutrients. Vitamins and minerals are micronutrients. And the five basic food groups are fruits, vegetables, grains, proteins, and dairy. Let's get a bit more specific on each to promote optimal health. So carbohydrates, you should offer a variety of vegetables and low sugar fruits, which provide a source of energy, vitamins and minerals and fiber. Limit your child's diet to less than 5% coming from simple sugars, the white stuff, and optimally from low glycemic, meaning those that are not gonna spike their blood sugar foods. Um, Starches are also carbohydrates and include legumes, complex grains, corn, peas, rice, and bread. Again, you want to avoid the simple carbs, breads, rice, pasta, which don't have fiber or many nutrients. Offer protein at every meal. So protein is essential for the construction of muscle, bone, and ligaments. Eat a variety of bread and white meat, eggs, nuts and seeds, and seafood. I'll show you some options, uh, both animal and plant-based, and the number of grams in a serving in the next slide. Certain fatty acids are essential, so omega-3 and omega-6 must be consumed in the diet, optimally from olives, avocados, nuts, seeds, fatty fish like salmon and mackerel. Healthy fats are necessary to absorb fat-soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K. Fiber should be the age plus five equals number of grams per day. So fiber improves digestive health by creating bulk in the stool and stimulating peristalsis or movement. It prevents constipation and diarrhea and is a protector against colon cancer. So fruits and vegetables are the chief sources of fiber. Here's a chart for calorie requirements based on age, sex, and activity. Children's calorie needs change as they age and vary with their activity level. So just, this is just, you know, an FYI, don't, it's not, you know, one, it's definitely not one size fits all, um, which as parents, it's easy to fall into that trap, serving all of our children um, the same amounts and types of food, regardless of their age or activity that day. Or maybe you automatically give your children the same size portions that you give yourself. So keep in mind that children's needs are quite different from that of adults and that you should allow them to listen to their own hunger and fullness cues. We'll talk more about serving sizes and portions. Here also is a plate of how to divide the nutrients up. Again, just recommended, use a child's plate seven inches in di diameter to ensure a smaller um, portion size. Um, as you see, it's mostly vegetables, quarter protein, then splitting up the fat, starch, and fruits. Again, what I'm giving you today are general guidelines, so please talk to your pediatrician and nutritionist for specifics that will meet your child's needs. Micronutrients and protein. So here's a list of nutrients from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Also some ideas of animal and plant-based protein sources and the number of grams of protein. So what can you do? Provide a variety of whole food options. The less processed, the better. Appropriately portion food based on age, size, activity. So this is, again, constantly changing as the child grows, changes activities, seasons. Don't buy the unhealthy options. So if it isn't in your kitchen, they can't eat it. Save desserts and treats for special occasions or when you go out to eat or at other people's houses. So having something sweet is seen as a rare occasion, not an everyday must have after each meal event. Choose foods and beverages with less sugar or no sugar. Water should be offered first. As I said um, previously, if your child drinks a lot of juice, you can begin by watering it down until it is mostly water with a splash of juice, um, you know, weaning them off of the juice. Or you can add slices of lemon, lime, or other fruit to water. Start small with changes to build healthier eating styles. So think about some of the strategies we've mentioned that you could try and incorporate, like slowly purging your kitchen or refrigerator as um, processed food is 
eaten, don't replace it, or swapping healthier options, just dip breakfast for a start. So instead of the sugary cereals, offer the plain yogurt with fruit or scrambled eggs with cheese. Um, you don't have to change everything at once. All right, let's talk about helping your family establish some healthy habits. Remember, the weight will fall into healthy range when you focus on health. Let's look at how we can um, start. It begins by researching with food sources. We'll look at how to read a nutrition label, proper serving and portion control, and the importance of involving your family in the process. So first up is the food label. In the United States, um, the, the Food and Nutrition the Food and Drug Administration updated the nutrition facts label requirements for packaged food, and the food labels in your country might be slightly different. But this updated label now has a bolder font sizes. Um, it has uh, updated serving sizes, daily values, a new added sugars line, and vitamin D and potassium are now required on the label, and vitamins A and C will no longer be required, but can be included voluntarily. So reading the food label, number one, the first place to start is the serving size and the number of servings in the package. Serving sizes are standardized to make it easier to compare similar foods. They're provided in familiar units like cups or pieces, followed by the metric amount, for example, the number of grams. The serving size on the food package influences the number of calories and all the nutrient amounts listed on the top part of the label. So pay attention to the serving size, especially how many servings are in the food package. Then ask, how many servings am I giving my child or am I consuming? Um, for example, half a serving, one serving or more, is a serving size appropriate for your child? Number two, look at the calories. So this is based on the serving size. Here, one cup is 280 calories. And calories, as we defined earlier, provide a measure of how much energy is in each serving of the food. Number three, check out the nutrients. So you wanna get zero trans fat, less sodium and less added sugars. You wanna get more of the following, the dietary fiber for healthy digestion, the vitamin D is needed to absorb calcium to build bones and plays a part in heart health and fighting infection. Calcium also needed for strong bones and keeps nerves and muscles working and heart healthy. Iron helps keep the body make new healthy red blood cells. And potassium is important for fluid balance and helps control the blood pressure. Number four, the percent daily value is the percentage of the daily value recommended for each nutrient in a serving of the food. Basically, I mean, it can help you determine if, if a serving of food is high or low in a nutrient. 5% or less is low, 20% or more is high. The ingredient list, there we go, is it shows the ingredient in a food by its common name listed in descending order by weight. So the ingredient that weighs the most is listed first and the ingredient weighing the least is last. In this example of Nutella, you'll see that sugar is the first ingredient and there are 11 grams of sugar per serving. So that's nearly three teaspoons of sugar per serving. Okay, just a reminder, serving size is the amount of food listed on a product's nutrition fact label. Portion is how much food you choose to eat at one time. So let's talk about how you can help correctly offer the right portions for your growing child. You want to use a children's plate with dividers or use a smaller plate like a seven inch salad plate. Don't let the kids eat out of bags or containers. So serve individual portions and make it a rule to eat in the kitchen. Dish out meals at the counter and avoid bringing the whole pot or dish to the table. So not keeping the food at arm's length can make your family think twice about reaching for seconds. And if they do want seconds, offer more vegetables or salads first. Aim for three scheduled healthful meals throughout the day. Skipping a meal can lead to overeating at the next one. Add more salads and vegetables full of fiber to your family's diet, especially at the start of a meal, which can help control hunger and give a sense of fullness. Try not to rush through meals, so go slowly and give everyone a chance to feel full before serving more. Don't insist that kids clean their plates. Encourage them to stop eating when they feel full. And when eating out, share meals. Order an appetizer as a main dish or pack up half to take home before you begin to eat. When getting takeout, you can order fewer meals and serve family style. And at fast food restaurants, you want to choose the kids' meals as long as they have healthy options right? It's not fried. There's vegetables. There's no soda. 
When cooking large batches or storing leftovers, separate them into smaller portions before you put them in the fridge or freezer. That way, when your family reaches in, they'll automatically grab a portion that makes sense. And one easy uh, way to size up portions, if you don't have any measurements, is to use your child's hand as a guide. So kids have smaller hands than adults, so it serves as a reminder that kids should have um, be eating smaller portions. A closed fish for fist for a portion of vegetables, fruit, or starch. A meat portion should be about as big as their palm. A serving of cheese is about the size of their thumb. Remember the role you play in showing your kids how to size up portions. If you overload your plate each meal and always have seconds or thirds, that's what your kids will learn too. And of course, as kids grow, their appetites will vary depending on a number of things. They tend to be more hungry during growth spurts or sport seasons when they're more active and less hungry during downtimes. As their appetites change, keep serving right-sized portions and encourage them to slow down to enjoy their food, then check in on whether they're, they're full um, before they go for seconds. Okay, involve them in the process. Coordinate schedules so that you can involve them in the process from planning, grocery shopping, prepping, cooking, and sharing meals. Menu and meal plan together. So what are the family favorites? Are there traditional recipes that you can help buy together? Grocery shop together. This is an opportunity to educate your children about different fruits, vegetables, looking at labels. You can prep or batch cook healthy items on the weekend together. So you have healthy options to grab uh, during the week easily. And of course, cooking together. Depending on the age, they can help gather ingredients, carefully chop, stir, combine, or help clean up. All right, let's talk about some challenges. Do you have a picky eater? A child's picky eating is generally temporary. So if parents do not make a big deal, it'll usually end before school age. So let's try these, uh, you can try these tips to deal with the child's picky eating behavior positively. You can let the children be the produce picker. So let them pick out fruits and vegetables at the store. Have the child help you prepare meals as your sous chef. So children learn about food and get excited about tasting food when they have helped to make the meal. So let them add ingredients, scrub the vegetables, help stir. Offer choices. So rather than ask, do you want broccoli for dinner? Ask, which would you like for dinner, broccoli or cauliflower? Enjoy each other while eating family meals together. So talk about fun and happy things. If meals are times for family arguments, the ch child may learn unhealthy attitudes toward food. Offer the same foods for the whole family. So serve the same meal to adults and kids. Children should see their parents enjoy healthy foods. Parents can talk about the colors, shapes, textures on the plate. You want to avoid catering to only serving them their preferred food. All right, children may not want to try new foods. It's normal for children to reject foods that they have never tried before, but here are some ways to go about it. Small portions, big benefits. So let the children try small portions of new foods that you enjoy. Give them a small taste at first and be patient with them. Only offer one new food at a time. So serve something that you know the child likes along with the new food. Offering many new foods at once could be too much for the child. Offer the new foods first so the child is most hungry at the start of a meal. Be a good role model so parents should try new foods themselves. Describe their taste, texture, and smell to the child. Sometimes new foods take time. Children's, children do not always take to new foods right away, so offer new foods many times. It may take up to a dozen tries for a child to accept a new food. Alrighty, small changes add up. Make, uh, making healthier choices doesn't mean making big changes all at once. Focusing on manageable small changes in shopping, cooking, and eating habits can lead to healthy lifelong changes. So if grocery shopping is a bit challenging with your children, here are some tips for parents to shop and eat a healthy diet. So eat before shopping. Grocery shopping hungry can lead to impulse buying and unhealthy food choices for everyone. Look for fresh vegetables and fruits that are in season. These are easy to get, have more flavor, and are usually less expensive. Try frozen fruits and vegetables. So frozen items might may be less expensive than fresh. 
think outside the store. So farmers markets and stands might um, be a great place to pick up the fresh produce at a discount. Avoid fat-free dairy items, which may contain sugar, preservatives, or chemicals in place of the fat that, that has been taken out. Read the nutrition labels and ingredient list, as we talked about. Try to limit the number of processed foods you buy overall. Instead of buying sugar-sweetened beverages, drink water, seltzer, mineral, and filtered water. Here are some strategies for eating out with your children. Always look for the child's menu that will have more appropriate portions. However, if they only have fried or unhealthy options, consider healthy appetizers as a substitute instead. If possible, you want to check the menu online before you go to ensure they, um, there are healthy options that your child will enjoy. You want to avoid dishes that are creamy, fried, breaded, and battered. Seek dishes that are steamed, grilled, baked, or broiled. Side dishes can, made, um, can add many calories to a meal, so ask if you can substitute for a healthier side. Again, you want to make sure portion size is correct. It can be twice or more of what you should be eating at a meal, and this can be the case even if it's from a child's menu. So ask for a takeout box and immediately put half the portion in the box or serve smaller portions onto a separate plate for your child. Ask for sauces or salad dressings on the side and then avoid the soda or juices and order water instead. Okay, right. parents can improve their children's nutritional uh, education using charts, games, and other activities to help making learning easy and fun. Researchers call this gamification, making learning a game. So next time we meet, we're gonna um, discuss and try out some of these activities together. And I'm just gonna list them all here for you. Um, lots of fun things that you can do. Unfortunately, childhood obesity is on the rise. So what are the key takeaways from today's session? The goal is to take active steps to prevent obesity. You need to model healthy eating, minimize the marketing exposure, provide good food options, and promote exercise. Key success factors include an authoritative parenting style with positive and direct communication and genuine displays of concern and empathy. You can model the emotional and internal regulation that corresponds with the management of hung hunger and satiety cues. Family involvement matters, have set meal times and eat together. Understand the basics of nutrition and how you can educate your child on label reading, making healthy food choices and reducing sugar, providing them with the life skills they need to choose and prepare uh, healthy food for themselves and establish lifelong healthy habits. If you're faced with some challenging situations with your kids, take a breath. We talked about a number of strategies and tips and tricks for you to try. Thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to our next session.